www.videonews.com. Okay, Dr. Richmond, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to have the opportunity to interview you. So first of all, uh, I'd like to get your first-hand reaction uh, to the Japanese government's, uh, I, I would say, expected decision, which can come as early as tomorrow, to dump the, uh, dump the contaminated water, uh, which Japanese government actually calls a processed water. Uh, from the badly damaged Fukushima Daiichi uh, nuclear power plant into the ocean. Uh, from mar uh, marine scientists' uh, viewpoint, uh, is it a good idea? Uh, and if not, why? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, no, I think it's a, a very bad idea. Um, I've been working as uh, part of the expert panel advisory to the Pacific Island Forum. Mm -hmm. So the 18 Pacific Island nations, uh, including also Australia and New Zealand. And after a year and a half of studying, I actually went to Fukushima last February as part of the Pacific Island Forum mission to Japan. Mm -hmm. And after reviewing copious documents and meeting with MOFA, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of uh, Economy, Trade and Industry, and TEPCO representatives, uh, I'm convinced that this is a, a bad decision at this point. Um, the data that were provided are insufficient to support this plan going forward, and quite the opposite. As a marine scientist, I look at the concerns that are there. Um, if we just start with the most general, uh, the oceans are already compromised in terms of ocean health, and there's a very clear link between the health of our oceans and the health of people. And so when I look, most of my work has been in the Pacific Islands for the last 44 years. Uh, when I look at how closely human health and environmental health are tied together. Um, we just can't continue to uh, treat the ocean uh, as the dumping ground for everything we don't want on land and expect the ocean to be able to withstand uh, all of these continued contaminants and stressors there. Uh, as a biologist, I study organisms and the way in which they respond to a variety of stressors. We have to remember that this is not a painting on a clean canvas, so to speak. The oceans are already um, uh, degraded uh, from a variety of pollutants, everything from heavy metals and mercury to plastics, pesticides, um, a whole variety of chemicals, and adding additional stressors is simply moving in the wrong direction. Uh -huh. um, interestingly enough, the International Atomic Energy Agency is part of the United Nations, uh -huh. uh, yet recently uh, the United Nations declared this as the ocean decade, uh -huh. trying to raise awareness of the plight of the oceans and the people who depend on it. And as recently as June of this year, 193 nations signed on to a new United Nations High Seas Treaty specifically to address these kinds of transboundary issues uh, with a real focus on water quality and reducing contamination. And so this plan moving forward is in direct violation of the spirit of the United Nations Ocean Decade, um, of the uh, recently signed uh, Open Ocean or uh, Transboundary a uh, high seas treaty, and the Pacific Island Forum came up with a brilliant 2050 blue continent strategy for what they hope the ocean will look like by the year 2050. And the continued use uh, to release the uh, treated radionuclide contaminated water into the Pacific is wrong, in my opinion, uh, because these radionuclides, A, can be um, picked up by marine organisms. They can be what we call trophically transferred. Uh, from the very lowest parts of the food web, the phytoplankton, the small algae, uh -huh. right up to the largest fish like tuna, uh -huh. and they can be bioaccumulated, which is the pathway by which it gets into people. Uh -huh. In seafood, everything from filter feeders like oysters and clams, um, things like lobsters and crabs, as well as large tuna. Uh, if we look back to 2011, when the disaster occurred, within a year, tuna that were caught off of San Diego, California, were found with cesium that could be tied back to Fukushima. Uh, notably, the levels were very low, but tuna can live for years, and this is plenty of time to accumulate more. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to realize when people talk about exposure to radionuclides and to ionizing radiation, there's a big difference between an external exposure where your skin or even clothing uh, can block beta emitters. But once you ingest uh, contaminated seafood, uh, your cells inside your body are not protected. Mm -hmm. And that's where we can see things like DNA damage, RNA damage, uh, things that are so critical mm -hmm. to organisms and their survival and their health. Um, you don't have to kill an organism to have a negative effect on it. Mm -hmm. And that's why we often look at what we call the sublethal mm -hmm. 
effects of these kinds of stressors on marine life and on the people who depend on it. And for those reasons, I remain very concerned about this plan. Okay. I think you touched almost everything I, I was going to ask, but I want to <laughs> go into a little bit of in, into details. Um, the Japanese government maintains that the, the, the contaminated water uh, is actually filtered, screened, and uh, uh, all radioactive materials are removed except the, uh, with the exception of uh, tritium. Uh, tritium. And, uh, and even that tritium water is uh, being diluted to the level which uh, meets the international standards or safety standards, as they say. Um, and, and therefore, it has negligible, uh, negligible effects on humans and the uh, environment. Um, do you buy that uh, explanation? No, I don't. Mm. And so, you know, tritium, yes, it is a, a radionuclide of concern, but for me, it's not necessarily the one of the greatest concern. Mm. But tritium can become what we call organically bound, mm. meaning it can be um, embedded in sediments. Mm. It can stick to organisms. It mm. can stick to the sediment. It can be uptaken. And when it becomes organically bound, it can accumulate in organisms. And there's a pretty rich literature. There's still a debate whether tritiated water is a concern. Mm. And arguments have been made by Japan that, well, other nuclear power plants are releasing uh, tritiated water as well. Mm. Um, I'm a firm believer that others' bad behavior is not an excuse for me to behave badly. Mm -hmm. And so we should be moving in the exact opposite direction of mm. trying to find ways to improve the response to these issues. Tritium in particular, um, if instead of continuing to use the ocean for dumping, um, I look at this as a lost opportunity. Japan and the International Atomic Energy Agency mm. could really be proactive mm. in using what was truly a catastrophe. And we all understand and we feel terrible for uh, the lives that were lost during the great earthquake and all the damage that occurred. Um, but from this challenge is also an opportunity to change the way in which such disasters are handled in the future. Sure. This is not the first nuclear power plant disaster, nor will it be the last. Mm -hmm. um, it's the second largest in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. um, Chernobyl was the worst. Mm -hmm. uh, number two is uh, Fukushima. Mm -hmm. The difference between the two is that Chernobyl was primarily a terrestrial and atmospheric release, mm -hmm. whereas Fukushima is primarily a marine release, mm -hmm. hence my concern about the oceans. Mm -hmm. um, but why isn't the IAEA in Japan using this as an opportunity to really evaluate new and better tools and techniques mm. for trying to remove and control the results of the waste and the accident that occurred mm. and use that as a step forward rather than a step backward. Mm -hmm. I'm far more concerned about other radionuclides like cesium-137, strontium-90, uh, cobalt-60, ruthenium-106. These are radionuclides where looking at the advanced liquid processing system, uh, the data are very uh, inconsistent. Mm. Um, are a number of samples that have indicated that they're not uh, at the level that one would want to be. And these are the ones, uh, including strontium in particular, the nickname for strontium is the bone seeker uh -huh. because strontium can get um, uh, embedded into bone. Right. And bones in people are a particularly sensitive area because our blood cells uh -huh. are constantly produced within the bone itself and in the marrow. And as a result, the kinds of damage you see from ionizing radiation from these radionuclides can be DNA damage, RNA damage, damage to very subtle signaling proteins that are responsible for everything from metabolism to immune systems. And when the IAEA says that it's consistent with accepted standards, um, some of these standards are years old and we have better techniques and technologies today uh -huh. to look at these very subtle sublethal effects. Uh -huh. And for that reason, I'm very concerned about missing the kinds of problems that occur over longer periods of time. This is truly a transboundary issue, meaning that the water will not stay within uh, Japan's territories. It'll spread, uh, spread throughout the Pacific um, through ocean currents and through marine organisms. Um, but it's also a transgenerational problem where it's gonna be released over 30 years at least, even longer. That's my generation, that's my daughter's generation and any grandchildren that should come along. And so for these reasons, there's a much better opportunity our expert panel examined uh, the use of uh, using this uh, water for concrete. Um, when I looked at the Fukushima site, it was very evident to me they need to, to make a lot of concrete to raise the seawall to the height that it should have been in the first place to even prevent this disaster. Uh -huh. TEPCO knew about the uh, inadequacy of their safety protocols years before this occurred, uh -huh. and they never acted responsibly. Uh -huh. 
So as they build up the seawall, uh, you may be aware there's an underground ice barrier to try to keep the groundwater right. out of the three reactors that are in meltdown. Um, this is also an opportunity to replace the ice barrier with concrete. And when I was at Fukushima, there's a lot of radioactive soil around the area. Uh -huh. They really should be stabilized. So if there's a typhoon or a bad storm, uh -huh. it doesn't get washed back into the ocean. Uh -huh. By using the concrete option and using the water, it would A, use it up in a shorter period of time. Our calculations are less than 10 years, probably five to seven. Uh -huh. But it takes away the transboundary concern. It takes away the bioactive uh, being a bio uh, biologically available to marine organisms. It keeps it on site. And if TEPCO is truthful in saying that the water from the Alps system is totally safe, then why is the Japanese government so adamantly opposed to keeping it on site uh, where this disaster occurred and uh, protecting the rest of the Pacific and the rest of the uh, region from potential exposure to these radionuclides? Okay. You are a marine scientist, marine biologist. So uh, I'd like to ask you uh, just one more question. Uh, from the uh, marine biologist's point of view, what does diluting, uh, diluting the, uh, uh, say, nuclear radioactive material do? I mean, they, you know, they are, they are du diluting the uh, uh, tritium water to the level which is uh, safe by, you know, international standards. But uh, you also mentioned uh, bio uh, accumulation or bio mag uh, magnification. You know, uh, it goes up the in the food chain, and then eventually it, uh, diluting uh, is sort of evened out. So. Uh, What's uh, from the you know marine biologist's point of view? That's diluting the uh, tritium water make it uh, actually safer or safe? Yeah, again with tritium because it's hydrogen, it will dilute in the ocean, mm. um, and this is the excuse that's being used uh, for all the other releases as well. Mm. It's important to point out that the cooling water at Fukushima is quite different. Uh, than the cooling water that's released from a properly operating nuclear power plant. Mm -hmm. We're talking about water that's in direct contact with cores that are in meltdown. Right. And that's right. a lot different than going right. through a heat exchanger right. that you would expect in a properly right. operating nuclear power right. plant. Once again, tritium is a concern because it can become organically bound. Mm -hmm. But these other radionuclides that I mentioned, there's about 10 to 12 that are of higher concern. Um, there are a total of 62 radionuclides that have been identified from the Fukushima cooling water. Um, some of them can be more or less ignored because they have very short half-lives, so I'm not worried about that. But there's about 30 that are of concern, and your question is a very important one, the bioaccumulation part. If the ocean was a sterile vessel, if it was a fiberglass container or a glass container, the chemistry of dilution works. You can calculate the volume of the ocean and the concentration of radionuclides and come up with a number, mm. which I've seen the calculations are accurate. Mm. But as soon as you add biology, ecosystems like the one behind me, the coral reef, mm. these organisms do the exact opposite of dilution. Mm. That is the uptake, trophic transfer through the food web and accumulation. So the idea that, as we jokingly say, that there was the belief that the solution to pollution is dilution does not hold up when the biology is at work. Mm. And this is the concern. When these radionuclides can be taken up into the biota, they can be accumulated over time. They can form reservoirs in the sediment as well. Mm. Uh, the radiological ecological impact assessment performed by TEPCO is inadequate, and it does not address many of the concerns that we've raised before. Um, the idea that they talk about monitoring, they're going to monitor what's going on. Monitoring doesn't prevent problems. It simply tells you when the problem occurs. And there's no way of literally getting what we say, the genie back in the bottle. Once the radionuclides are released into the ocean, mm. once they get picked up by marine life, there's no way of getting it out again. Mm. And so for that reason, the precautionary principle, which I always adhere to as a marine biologist, tells you that if there is a way of keeping it out of the ocean, keeping it out of the organisms, and keeping it out of the way of getting into people through seafood, mm. that would be the logical and the best way forward. Mm. There is an alternative. But Japan and TEPCO have refused to mm -hmm. adequately address this, and mm -hmm. this is a shame. Mm -hmm. um, just in addition to um, bioaccumulation or biomagnification, uh, if you know anything about this um, organic uh, tritium, um, tritium's half-life is very short, but once it gets into the, uh, the body of the organism, uh, uh, it, it became organic uh, tritium, and it can stay longer in the body. Uh, some scientists say, if you if you know anything about it, and if you can explain to us uh, why 
tritium can uh, act differently uh, from water once it gets into the body and uh, it it uh, it tied up with the uh, the organ uh, you know organism. Yeah, again, a very good question. So this term organically bound tritium, it's uh, uh, called OBT, OBT, is a concern. Um, there are ways in which you classify tritium. One is when you talk about organically bound tritium, exactly what you mentioned, it can bind to organic material, to sediments, to algae, to organisms. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between the external exposure, and I've heard time and time again, it's below drinking water standards. Mm -hmm. This is kind of a distraction. Nobody's talking about drinking ocean water. Mm -hmm. And if you drink tritiated water, it passes through within a few days. It's not really the same mm -hmm. as eating something that has organically bound tritium. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a fraction called non-escapable mm -hmm. uh, and insoluble tritium, which is what you mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, there are studies that showed in the liver of bottom fish, um, this can be biologically uh, active or present for over 500 days, so nearly two years. Mm -hmm. So the difference between people talking about tritiated water, drinking it, this is a, a really poor uh, comparison because we're not talking about drinking tritiated water. Mm. We're talking about tritium getting organically bound in sediments and in organisms, then entering into people. And that's where these inescapable or non-escapable and insoluble forms can bind, especially to things like the liver that has higher lipid levels, higher fat levels. This is how it gets organically bound. And even though it's a low level beta emitter, once it's in there, it's continuing to bathe cells inside of the body. And that's where things like DNA damage, RNA damage, signaling protein right. damage can occur. Oh. And over time, you know, it's very hard, but this is where we normally see associated the concern with cancers. Oh. The more exposure you have to ionizing radiation for longer periods of time, oh. these don't show up quickly, oh. but they will show up eventually years, even decades. And that's why we say this is truly not only transboundary, but transgenerational, also considering the amount of time this is going to take to release uh, this uh, contaminated water. Mm -hmm. So all of these questions are a great concern. When we've raised them, they've been dismissed out of hand, and I think to the detriment of the environment and the people who depend on the ocean for their health and their food. Okay. Great. Very last question. Very last question. Um, what does this dumping of the contaminated water mean to the rest of the world? And what's the worst scenario that we, we, we should expect uh, out of this? Yeah, we do know that this is one of the um, stochastic effects of ionizing radiation is enhancing certain kinds of cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, those are things that will take time to show up. And so this is why pretending that it's not going to be a problem is uh, maybe letting it go today at a cost to tomorrow. Um, we're not going to see massive mortality or death. This is not going to be end of the world. But we have an ocean that's already under impacts from climate change and pollution and overfishing. Um, these oceans sub uh, provide subsistence for billions of people throughout the world. Mm -hmm. And we know that we're already seeing uh, the decline of ocean health and the impacts it has on economies, on fisheries, on cultures. Um, I think this is a big issue for human rights as well. And the three uh, United Nations rapporteurs dealing with uh, human rights have all come out strongly against this. Mm -hmm. And we talk at all was one of the nuclear testing sites for the United States during the 50s and 60s. I personally examined and witnessed how radionuclides can get picked up by the seafood, by plants, and get through the food chain into people. And for that reason, maybe I'm more sensitive to it than most scientists that have never lived on a radioactive atoll. But I consider this to be ill-advised. Mm. Um, it's not the way forward. And frankly, I feel it's irresponsible. Mm. And once again, going back to say, as tragic as this disaster is and has been, why does Japan and the IAEA use this as the perfect opportunity to improve the way in which these kinds of incidents are handled to leave a better future and legacy for generations to come? Mm. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Richmond. Uh, next time, um, if we have, a, we have a chance, uh, I'd like to do the interview on the coral situation in Okinawa, which is, I'm very interested in. And I think you are, you are real expertise at coral, right? Yeah, I spent a lot of time at University of the Ryukyus, uh, oh, really? at the uh, uh, Sissoko Marine Laboratory. And Okinawa has amazing corals, wonderful coral scientists. So right. I'd be happy to discuss that with you as well. OK, thank you very much.
Appreciate right. it. Have a good one. Take yeah, care. Bye-bye.